welcome back to uh, the latest episode of Hull and Back, talking about the league. Um, well, it's not the league, is it? It's the cup. Um, <laughs> Good start there, Ant. Um, but obviously, uh, we, played, <laughs> we played Everton in the cup um, last time out. Uh, obviously, we played very well. Uh, didn't get the result that we wanted in the end. It was a 3-2 defeat after taking them to extra time. Um, but loudly across the board of City fans, journalists, anybody who was watching, uh, we've just got praise to and from top to bottom, really. It was, I think there weren't really any bad performers that game for us. Uh, so, obviously, we'll talk about it. I think um, I'll go to uh, Nathaniel first this time because I went to Will first last time. Um, was there any player that you could probably bring up above any of the others or was it just a team effort? Well, I mean, I, as we were just saying before then, I disagreed with Jermaine Genus, Cal Surprise, um, with the man of the match being Lewis Potter. Who, who Lewis Potter was really good, but um, especially... Oh, sorry. He played... It was a fluke in that game. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, any scouts listening, he's not that good, really. Um, yeah, I'd go Honeyman. I mean, it was just so unbelievably great. Like, sometimes when we're bigging up well, like last year, maybe, when I was bigging up Sean McLaughlin in the cup against Stevenage and he plays really well. That's just sort of me joking. Like, you know, he's playing against Stevenage. But then, like, oh, Honeyman's world class. But that game, he was. Like, every single time he got the ball um, and off the ball with his running, just absolutely superb to watch. I mean, everyone was great. It was probably most of our players' best performances in their careers because not many of them will have played against a Premier League team anyway. Uh, or played that well. So, I mean, everyone was great. Um, and a fair few of the Everton players were great. Damari Gray in particular was like, he turned into Messi for most of that game. Um, but I'd go Honeyman because of him on the ball and off the ball with his running. Um, he was just magnificent. But again, that was a fluke. So don't, don't sell him. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I thought it was, uh, Everton's in one of them in it because like, um, like Brownie said on the last episode, you know, they were they're in a situation where they're really struggling and the fans, it's easy to turn against the manager with him being ex-Liverpool and mm. and whatnot. And obviously Newcastle fans held him as a saviour, even though he did know better than Steve Bruce. Um obviously he's coming to Everton, he's not really worked out for him either. Um, you know, he had a few of his big hitters mission in, in Richarlison, Calvert Lewin, etc. But they still had a good team out. Like they, they wanted to win that game. Let's 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 not pretend that they took it easy or you know played the youngsters or anything because there was only a couple. Is it that Gordon maybe was the youngest on the pitch for them? But uh, and then Begovic in goal, who's not really a, a bad second choice keeper to have, is he? Let's be honest. Um, but I think the midfield, especially for me before the game, you know the likes of Alan and Andre Gomez, who were very good players. Um, you had to look at the likes of Doherty, Smallwood and Honeyman going to have quite a busy game in that sense. Um, but I thought on the, on the most part, they, they, they more than matched um, what was a very strong Premier League side. And, you know, coming from watching them against Blackpool, where we looked kind of lethargic and lacklustre, to going into Everton and really taking the game to them, I thought was um, was really good. And yeah, Honeyman was, really was at the heart of that. He was non-stop, even look, even to like the 116th minute of extra time, he looked like it was a 10th minute. Mm -hmm. uh, he was still going. Uh, but like we say, um, I, I'm going to come to you, Eves, uh, Will, not Eves, <laughs> because the name pretty much <laughs> says what I'm going to ask you about, really. Tom Eves, I think, you know, becoming a bit of a cult hero, even though he's not really uh, pulled up any trees in a Hull City shirt. But one thing I think you get from him every single time he plays is at least 100% effort. And arguably his best game in a Hull City shirt? Oh, easily. I mean, uh, I, there's not much I can say really about him. This picture will say it all, really. I mean, let's be honest here. Um, uh, for the audio listeners, that was Eve's uh, photoshopped onto Jesus. What do you yeah. mean photoshopped? <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah, that was just a um, uh, paparazzi photo. Um, it was easily his best game in a City shirt, bar none. And that's funny considering he's got a hat trick. In the last FA Cup third round game he played, um, it was un it was just unplayable. For I, I will say something to be honest about Everton. I know you said quite a few of them played well, Nathaniel. I thought they were shit. Uh, but they <laughs> they, they had spells. Damari Gray was up great. Front, up front, they were fine, but at the back, yeah, Eves made them 
an absolute fucking shambles. As mm. did Randall Williams early on, on the out wide, and as did Longman when he came on, and as did KLP. Sorry, no, he didn't. Um, <laughs> but it's when we were attacking, they just could not deal with, especially on set pieces, they just could not deal with City mm. at all at the back. And I think players like Eves were a major part of that. He just everything he did just worked. And the fact he didn't score was so unlucky. I mean, you know, the header early on, and then obviously there was the saving extra time from Begovic. Two great saves. Well, they save. Mm. Um, I don't know how Eves didn't get a goal, but yeah, Eves for England. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think the thing, you know, we, we, we've asked this question on this pod a few times, you know, like what 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 is our ideal strike partnership up top? Who should we go with? Who's our best striker? We saw it. Should, <laughs> should we bring, yeah, should we bring KLP Longman up top kind of thing? And we, we, we tried that against Blackpool until Elder got injured and we had to shift stuff about. Tyler Smith has looked promising for the most part without really scoring. Obviously, he's changed that now. First minute of the game, smallest player on the pitch, somehow mm. scored a header. Um, he didn't even need to jump for it, which was amazing. Um, you know, like, it was... It was. It, do you know what? I found it really, really um, refreshing to see another side just as bad as us defending set Yeah, because <laughs> they, they said they conceded nine or it, something. Yeah. Every time we got a corner or a free kick, I actually got up because I was like, oh, mm. we might score it. Yeah, uh, I, I can't it remember was... if me or Joel said that at the time, and I can't remember which one of us said it, but someone said it because we were sat together about, are they as shit as their pieces as we have been? Yeah, yeah we've it's been poor. We, we looked all right. Defending-wise, I thought we were pretty good. Mm. I mean, because mm. it was a Premier League side. Yeah, it's... And uh, Benitez side as well. <laughs> Yeah, they're normally he's he's known for structure and and um, discipline. So it was it was quite it was a way for us to try and exploit a weakness of theirs. And obviously we got off to a very good start. I thought the opening 10, 15 minutes we were very very good and we looked uh, unplayable. We looked like the Premier League side. Um, obviously Everton then had a spell about you know in, in the middle of the first half where you know they started to turn on the burners. I think the first goal, which was against the runner player, but was obviously a very well worked goal. Like we said, Damari Gray was one of their uh, only shining lights in terms of standing out uh, performer. Um, obviously working his way with a nice one-two into the box and finishing nicely. I think that goal sort of took the wind out of our momentum and they sort of took advantage of that. Um, a bit of poor defending from the second one, I thought it was very static, um, which we've had a couple of times this season. I think it's just due to the, you know, the, the, the young defence that we've got. Because um, if you watch that goal back, the cross goes into the box, we've got at least four players stood in that area and not one of them attacks the ball. And Andre Gomez, who's a centre midfielder, not known for heading the ball, somehow runs into the box and nods it in. So, you, you know, you look at them kind of goals and you get disappointed, especially when you think, oh, you know, we played so well and we, the game's just totally flipped. And you think, you know, it's going to be one of them. Um, but then we sort of picked ourselves back up again and finished the first half quite strongly. Um, and, and, like, pretty much every, every tweet or anything on social media was, we're still in this, um, you know, the, the, we might be 2-1 down, but there was a strange belief that we were going to come back into it, which I think is um, not the norm where in, in, in most cases when City um, allow a lead to slip away. It's usually the, um, the the other extreme. But And then in the second half, we really took the game to them, I thought, and um, I thought we finished the stronger side of the two. Um, obviously, Longman's world-class uh, mm. left foot peg finish. Um, very, very nice goal. Probably like the opposite to the... Um, to the goal he scored the other week, um, you know, placed into the far corner, but with his other foot, so it's nice to see he's got a bit of a uh, variety in, in yeah. being able to be the feet. Um, and then obviously took it to extra time, where it was pretty much anyone's game. You know, we looked a little bit tired in some cases. Everton looked like they didn't want to be in extra time. Um, it's pretty. It was a bit of a shame, I think, that we didn't get a replay. Goodison, I think, they'd have enjoyed that. It would have uh, been a replay, on it would have gone straight to penalties. Mm. No, no, that's what I mean. But we had extra time in pens this time because, um, obviously, Klopp, yeah. etc., have all complained about extra games uh, and COVID ramped squads that um, you had to. Both managers had to agree to a replay or something. I think it is. I'm not sure. I mean, um, as someone who was in the ground, I did not want that game to end. I wanted well, yeah, that to, was, I wanted well, that to no go one to penalties. Did. Um, it's one of the best games I've not, seen. Yeah, I mean, it was it was it was one of them games where I think we're not used to seeing both sides being so entertaining. Like you know, we either sort of we win by being solid and looking the better side, and the other team was poor or vice versa. Yeah, uh, but this game really was just it was. I think uh, Bernsey described it as rip roaring, and it, it was mm. a really really enjoyable watch. Uh, I watched it at work with people who didn't support either side, and they they enjoyed watching it. 
Um, oh, for a neutral, so it, it was one of them. Fantastic but... game. Yeah, I mean, after yeah, 10 yeah, minutes, yeah, you could tell the BBC would have been rubbing their hands thinking they've chosen the best game because it's one of the most entertaining games I've seen in a while. Either team could have won with two or three more goals. Um, you know, it's proper cup tie. Um, mm. And, uh, I mean, you're saying about um, going to extra time, but I think it's a real shame that we didn't win it late on in real real time because we had the chances of a few of the crosses going into Eve's I just didn't quite, you know, uh, agonisingly close to falling to someone and they just didn't. So I think even though maybe, uh, we haven't mentioned it yet, but Everton should have had probably at least two penalties for handballs against Greaves specifically. Yeah. Um, at the bare minimum one, but um, on I think maybe unlikely not to have three. So, but even so, we had the chances and we could have no, the other way, Andre Gomez should have been sent off. Yeah, um, yeah, that's... which no one seems to have talked about. But when you see, it, he's already on a yellow card, and the elbows honeyman him in the face. Yeah, oh, if he was already on a yellow. It, it, it wouldn't have been a straight red card, but the fact that he was on a yellow card, it was definitely. I the, didn't know that. Offense. Yeah, it should have gone then, because it's a foul, regardless no, of whether he means about... it or not. So I didn't honestly. I didn't even see that until someone posted no, it on Twitter didn't. the following day. No, I and saw I like... it at the time, on the replays. Yeah. Well, but, I was I was in the ground, mm. so I couldn't really tell. To be fair, um, I mean the penalties you couldn't tell at the time at all. You wouldn't mm. have known there were handballs. No, I can imagine in the stadium that. it would have been a tough one, but, but yeah, um, for the ref. from from where, from where I was watching it on the telly, it was um, I, I would say at least two of them should have been penalties because Greaves' hands are so far yeah, up. He's, he, you I, cannot I justify them being that far up. No, um, for either of them really. No, and I mean they, they were very them. close to him, but. You know, it's still it's, it's, his hands are out wide. He's made himself bigger, yeah. kind of thing. So I think with VAR, I mean, they said this on the on on the telly that oh, VAR they got penalties there. Um, but I mean, um, I mean, Greaves is lately is is is, is <laughs> it's been very close to or has given away mm. penalties lately. So maybe he needs to um, readjust his body shape when he's when he's blocking yeah, shots or something. <laughs> um, what about their third goal then? Are we saying good goal or does Baxter need to do better? Well, it's both, isn't it? Oh, like, he should do better, but it is a good goal because it's, you know... He's unsighted, to be fair. Yeah, and it's swerved. But I... We can't be too critical because it's, you know, the FA Cup. Like, it's not an important game, really, for us. Um, so, uh, I think he could have saved it. But he did make one save earlier on in the game, really low down uh, to his side that I didn't think he was going to save. So... You know that those sort of cancel out, really. Yeah, I mean, we. we I think that's we, we've said this before when like Ingram was playing well and he made a, a mistake or two. I think like uh, thinking back to QPR at home, etc. Mm -hmm. um, you know, sometimes you can have you know, goalkeepers one error and that's it. You can you've conceded a goal, aren't you? Whereas other players can get away with it. Um, yeah. Goalkeepers really can't. You know, is it's it's deep into extra time. I know goalkeepers don't run about, but. Like we say, it possibly shots uh, unsighted by the defender and the, the shot probably. I mean, to me, you should have been expecting Andros Townsend to shoot from there because I was expecting him to shoot. Because that's what he does. Yeah, but very good, very good shot. I, I think he saves it backwards kind of thing. But like we say, it's, 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 like, it's easy to be critical in that situation when you don't know what he could see and, and his reaction time, what his window of opportunity was to, to readjust his body shape. He might have been going for far corner, but... Um, you know, three two loss definitely not um, anything to be annoyed about. I don't think I, I you know, I, when the full time whistle went, I was kind of disappointed that we didn't take it to penalties and have that lottery. But um, I, I walked away from it saying, Do you know what, we played really well there. Um, you know, it's, it's a Premier League. Yes, they're, they're not performing well in the Premier League, but it is a Premier League side that have got you know players that are worth more than our entire yeah. squad value, Pro proper quality. Uh, yeah, I mean, you've got to look at the likes of Demar. I know Demari Gray only costs like just under two million or something, which is an absolute steal. Mm. Um, but that boy was was uh, sensational. I thought he was the absolutely he was a star player, yeah. and I think he's probably. I mean, Rafa Benitez is getting a lot of criticism um, at the minute, and probably quite rightly so for the run of form. But I think Demari Gray is a Rafa Benitez signing, is he not? And he's probably the mm. only one that's playing well. So maybe the problem isn't. Rafa, it's, it's it's the culture, you know, and the and the previous signings, players, maybe attitudes not being right or something like that. Uh, 
it's not for us to know really when they're not in our league yeah. we're not bothered, but, I um, wouldn't be too encouraged as an Everton fan even though they won because no. like ha- however well we played we're still a lower championship team that with a lot of like higher league one players you could argue and they just about squeezed past um yeah but I don't think it helps that no matter how much quality they've got their forward options without Richardson and Calvert Lewin are pretty diabolical. Like, yeah, Rondon. I want to. I want to compare Eves's salary with Rondon and how much yeah. effort they did. Um, you know, as target men, there was one doing his job and one just wasn't. Yeah. So what about then? Obviously, we we uh, the Eves Tyler Smith partnership has been sort of longed for by fans for quite a while, and we've not really had chance to see it too often. Um. What did we think to it then? Does that little and large partnership work? Is 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 that the front two to go with from now on? Seems yes. <laughs> I mean, it just but it, it it seems to bear more fruit as a partnership than any other one that we've had recently. Simply put, it's, it's the work rate, isn't it? As well, yeah. not just the quality, yeah. but Eve's Eve's. You know, cause that's the thing. You want your target man to do lots of running um, and win the ball, and then your little guy can run onto it. Although it's a bit funny that Tyler Smith. As you said, the shortest player on the pitch scored a header. Yeah. Um, it doesn't yeah, look but... bad in the air, you know. When we aimed a few balls at him, he didn't. No. He, won, he won a few of them, considering his mm. height. Yeah. I think what what I think what puts Tyler Smith in in a in a must start bracket for me is if we're insisting on playing this sort of mixture of because I've noticed at the moment, like last se- beginning of the season when we weren't playing well, we kept just lumping it long and it would come yeah. straight back. Then we started playing it on the ground a bit where we were playing well, but we weren't really carving out chances and we were losing games. Yeah. So now he's blended both of them. And I think this 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 system has helped to sort of mix it up. So we try and play out from the back. If we get pressed high, it's like, all right, then fair enough. They try and hit it in behind and exploit Tyler Smith's pace to get in behind and really cause the defence problems. And I think when he makes that run, it stretches defenders away and it leaves Eves like one-on-one with his defender in terms of winning that header. Because even if Smith makes the run and they don't go for it, two defenders have followed him because he's that quick and he's that dangerous. He's got them mm. their, them focused somewhere else in the game. The Eves then only has to beat one player to the header. He's not, he's not you know, doubled up on. Uh, and, and that, to me, having that variety up front and that ability to, to, to keep defenders guessing and not forcing us to do the same thing over and over again and knowing they can deal with it, I think that's going to be important to, to scoring goals in the Championship. And I know... Tom Eves hasn't scored many, let's be honest. Um, but for me, like you can forgive a lack of quality if they go out there and give 110% all the time. And I think that's what you get with Tom Eves. Um, I know mm-hmm. McGuinness had a very, very good season last season. Um, probably a better finisher than Eves. Well, definitely a better finisher than Eves than from what we've seen in a City shirt. But do you get the same you know, running about and work ethic that, that Tom Eves gives you? Probably not. But it's another one of them arguments like similar to Huddleston and Smallwood, like, We've got so many different players that offer something different to the squad. And, and in this current system, it allows us to change it up sometimes and, and have mm. that different option. So that's going to be quite good. Um, what about then? the? I mean, I put this poll out on Twitter and it was a quite a landslide for um, one of them. Um, I said, because it's a very interesting discussion at the minute, is that holding midfielder, deep line playmaker, whatever role you want to call it, the Smallwood role. Like obviously, um, uh, Richie Smallwood's been playing very, very well, mm-hmm. very well. Like you know, he came in for a bit of criticism beginning of the season, uh, pre-season as well. Sort of has been silencing his doubters, uh, doubters. But Tom Huddleston comes on and makes such a huge impact. But they're such different players. So, given the opportunity, say you're manager of the club, both of you. Separate times, obviously. Mm. Who are you starting and why? Well, I mean, I don't think it's like just simple. Um, I know it's not. That's a good answer. It depends on who you're playing against. I don't think into it that much. No, I will look into it this much. (laughs) On Sunday, we're playing Stoke. Who would Mm. I rather have playing against Stoke? Would I rather have someone who's going to need the ball, need space to make passes. I would have someone who's going to battle in midfield against them. It depends on the opponent. Is 
Yeah, I mean, I I think uh, I'd love to play Huddleston all the time, but he'll make your choice for you because you'll start him against Stoke and within 20 minutes he'll get crunched and be injured. So it doesn't matter. So, I mean, I I, I guess you'd play Huddleston because he played really well, but um, it's just whether he can stay fit. But then it was like the Terrell situation. Terrell, every time he played, he got injured. But when he's fit, you should really be playing him. But you can't just not play him because he'll get injured because then you don't get any benefit at all. So I think... And they do have similar sort of qualities. So it's not like you're missing out on anything. Well, the biggest biggest difference is that Huddleston could probably control a game a lot better in terms of his range of passing, his his ability to, to operate in tight spaces... Uh, in terms of ball control, get himself out of a situation. You know, if a team's pressing you, Huddleston's going to get you out of that situation nine times out of ten, whereas Smallwood mm. possibly would would make a poor pass and would lose it. But then again, Smallwood is going to offer you far more in terms of being a combative midfielder, throwing into tackles, breaking up play, than what Huddleston can do, do. That, so, to be fair. Huddleston can do that. I, d- I just don't think he has the same defensive strengths. No, I mean, he, he, he's fairly specialty. capable of. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, in terms of like Smallwood's more of like an Ashby mould where he, he just wants to be in there and, and break up play and then easily just make a three-yard pass to somebody who's better than him. Whereas Huddleston will get the ball and his first thought is to look up and see if anybody's yeah. making a running behind. Um, so it, this is why I asked the question on the pod because it, it's it, uh, it's so different, uh, well, so difficult to, to, like we say, in terms of who you're playing, maybe you can switch it up kind of thing, but I think um, the Tigers down under replied and they said um, that you'd start Smallwood and then bring Huddleston on to sort of see the game out. Yeah, maybe. But then I counted them and says, but then maybe you could flip that and say, why don't you start Huddleston, start on the front foot, be more attacking, put the game to bed and then let Smallwood see the game out. So yeah. you, can, you, can, you know what I mean? There's reasons for both and it's perfectly justifiable for both. But I think the biggest compliment that we can give to Richie Smallwood right now is that he's keeping Tom Huddleston out of the side. Yeah, that's and, quite and, and, something. You know, he should look at that and, and you know take pride in that, especially considering the, the the flack that he's got lately. Yeah, um, um, he's been playing very well, and especially alongside you know them two never tiring dynamos in Doherty and Honeyman. And um, mm-hmm. I think it's also a special mention. I thought uh, Randall Williams played very well. Um, uh, we, I think a couple of us predicted him to play in that right wing back role, didn't we? I mean, mm. obviously, he didn't, it, <laughs> he didn't quite have the same effect that Ryan Longman did when he came no, on. Of course not. Um, he, he played very well. Uh, and it's nice to know that him as hey, an option as a wing back is. He won is the a, free kick that got Yeah, that's, true. that's yeah. true. I think what I like about Randall Williams is he isn't pretending to be something he's not. You know, he's, he's very fast and he's another one who sort of runs his socks off when he's on the pitch. Um, and I think we haven't, we're, we're still yet to see what he can offer entirely um obviously he's not going to get in the squad at the minute in terms of form but because you know you're not going to dismantle um well, actually no you could drop klp because he's not that good but um <laughs> uh you know he's not, he's not going to get proper chance to, to start yet so it was nice to see him get an opportunity in the cup um and i thought Moncare looked quite good when he came on obviously we mentioned that he was one of the um the missing men of late uh where he just yeah. sort of vanished out of the squad and wasn't seen for a while, but he came on and he looked very direct and had some lovely touches. Uh, yeah, he obviously did the assist for Ryan Longman's goal where he just mm-hmm. ran straight at the heart of the Everton defence and then just laid it off to him. Um so it's nice to know that we've got some um good options to come on off the bench um going into my question, my question is he's not played since October. Why? Because mm. it can't just be yeah, it can't just be injury because it's not form, is it really? Because yeah, we were rubbish for most of that. Yeah, but does his, drop, does his drop from the side coincide with Honeyman coming back? Yeah, probably. Even so, why has he not appeared hmm. in that time? Hmm. Because you want Honeyman on the pitch at all times. Yeah, but Honeyman's come off the pitch several times in that time and even Monkey's sure. not come on. Sure. Yeah, it's been uh, canon, really, isn't it? I, suppose. Yeah, it's... I don't know. Hmm. I mean, He's not obviously... had a single minute since October, Monkey, which that's, is a that's very surprising. Yeah. Yeah, I, I do like him as a player. I think I think there's definitely a, a very technically gifted player there. I don't think yeah. he's another one. We, have, we haven't really seen the best of him yet, kind of thing. You know, he was thrown in at the deep end at the beginning of the season when Honeyman was, was injured and mm-hmm. sort of had to adapt to a new side. And then, like you say, he's not played since. So it, maybe coming on off the bench, we'll start to see a better version of him because it's less pressure and 
you know, coming on off, it's, I think it's easier to come off the bench and try and make an impact than it is to sort of consistently keep a run inside. Yeah. Um, is there anybody else that we missed? I thought we might see Brandon Fleming, but we didn't. He chose to play um, King Lewis Potter, which again wasn't surprising. Um, he came. He kept the same back three. Uh, was Alfie Jones on the bench? Maybe. I believe I he back. was. I'm not one hundred percent. No look. Because he's because he's another one. Like obviously you're not going di- to displace any of that back three at the minute. Um, but then again, he if he's not playing as a centre back, he's <laughs> playing in a small role. But then you've got Smallwood mm-hmm. and Huddleston. So yeah, where's probably. Alfie Jones going to fit into the side? <laughs> well, he won't at the minute, will he? That's what I mean. Like, mm. he's got to be a centre back option, obviously, because if we're going to play three at the back, he needs to be a centre half in that sense to boost the numbers. Um, I thought Doherty was his usual energetic self. Um, I was he's surprised when he came off because he was playing very well. Yeah, but I think he's saving a mini for Stoke. Mm. But I, I mean, Doherty, you know, true, but that is, you know, um, it was eight days away at the time. So I thought, I suppose that helped McCann because if. We had a game, you know, tomorrow night, uh, Tuesday night. Um, maybe it wouldn't have been as strong because he'd have to focus on the league. But I think it helped that we had a game, you know, an extra day after um, than usual. So we could play a strong team. Well, in hindsight, he was right to take him off. Well, yeah, because yeah, Monker did do well. Yeah, Can, um, I think um, this is this has been well, um, well received as well, is that we should be offering quite a bit of praise to McCann for such a positive triple substitution. Mm, I was very surprised. A lot earlier than what we're used to in making subs. Um, Because he's a young coach, really, as a manager, so he'll still be learning these things, you know. He hadn't really been in many jobs before he came to us, and I think he's learnt through a relegation and a promotion, although you'd rather he had gone down at all. He'll have learnt a huge amount. I know I'm being so fickle with the, saying the strikers are great and saying McCann's done well after the amount of criticism I've given them, but I think it's due. And it, I think at the moment it would be a shame if by next week with the takeover, maybe, finally mention the takeover this episode, um, it would be a shame or unfortunate for him to go, I think, at the moment. Hmm. Yeah, I think I'd like to see him at least have a, a decent run of games um, given the takeover actually gets confirmed this week um, as recent tweets have previously also suggested but now mm. seem to be pretty uh, leaning towards it will happen I think week. it is this week yeah, I finally I do see. think it, it, it's going to be Wednesday maybe um, and then happen maybe to see him 31st of February 1st of Feb that's a long time away Will. Mm. I don't think you actually listened to what I said then did you no I didn't what know. did you say the 31st of February. Oh. Ha ha. <laughs> I don't appreciate good jokes. Was that a good joke? <laughs> no, no, it wasn't. <laughs> no, it wasn't. Disgusting behaviour. First you steal my tweet, <laughs> and then you try and make it your own. <laughs> uh, for audio listeners, uh, Will has just showed evidence of um, Ant stealing the triple substitution idea. It's not copyright, Will. Disgusting behaviour. <laughs> Disgusting. Um, where were we? Yeah, where were we actually? Um, take over. No, yeah. Take so, over. Would, given the takeover comes through, I think it's going to be interesting to see if, I mean, they should do if if rumours are to be believed that um, he actually gets quite a bit of backing, uh, and let's see what players he can he, he can sign. Correct, your mask. Correct, your mask. With a want... picture, want there of. Um, Action with um, Cenk Tosten want their after oh, the game. That would be class. That was obviously going to happen. There was no way that <laughs> wasn't going to happen. Yeah. Would you it's... actually take him, though? Is he, is he well, ever played course. that much recently? Yeah. He's played a few He's be on a wages. Well, he, he played oh, most. He played against us. That'll, that'll do. But, yeah, I suppose oh. it, it's a lot of these things are wages. Like, even though it's Fenerbahce and maybe we'll have a we'll be able to spend a bit more. Most of the players we've been linked to from the top divisions of Europe will be on bigger wages. And um, we're not like the... I mean... I don't even think we're backers will be the top end of the spending 
chance for the for the league. I think a lot of players in the championship will be on bigger wages than they are in the area. Mm, I, <laughs> yeah. I think in terms it's of wages, we're in the bottom three. We're very low down. Yeah. I suppose maybe that means, though, uh, it's not like we're already a, uh, a, a... It's not like there's already a big wage bill for action to pay. So, basically, he can spend as much as he wants because it's at the same peanuts time, at don't the moment. Wanna run into the risk of bloating that wage bill. No, I, I only think we need two to three signings this window. We just have to be good. Does anyone know how much it is? Uh, obviously, because we're technically still under a transfer embargo, are we not? So obviously, you'd have Only to until the takeover happens. As soon as the takeover happens, we'll be out of it. Yeah, how much I... is it that we're supposed to pay back? I don't think it's that much. I know it were, it want a it want a large amount. I don't. I, I have no. Summer, it? I have no like source for this, but my in my brain, for whatever reason, it's saying. Two to three million ish. That's my. That's what my brain's telling me. But I don't know I where no that. Idea. They got that info from. There's not actually been any confirmation, has there, about the embargo, like about whether that would still be in place or not. I it assume it will be because I think the, under the original terms is we took a loan from the EFL. Yeah. Um, and in turn taking a transfer embargo for doing so until we well, pay it back. Yeah, I so mean, unless we pay it back, we'll still be in it. But is there? A, do we know if there's a clause saying if you pay it back, you can buy players, or is it just well, a year? It's a loan, isn't it? If you write, if you write that loan off, then you you, you don't owe anything, do you? Well, I hope so. That, that, It'd be embarrassing otherwise. Because, I, because in... what was it? Ehab said, didn't he, that it was either we take the loan and the embargo from the EFL, or we sell Keen Lewis Park. Yeah. So he said he took the loan because he wanted to keep KLP, which yeah. obviously in hindsight... Is so he can sell him for more later. <laughs> yeah, so he can boost his transfer value, not knowing that the takeover was going to happen. But um, we'll, 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 Since we're talking about transfers, then we'll talk about a couple before we look ahead to Stoke because it'd be weird to go from that topic and back to it. Um, obviously, linked with pretty much any player that's played in the Turkish league um, that you can think of that wants to leave or could leave. Um, a couple of them are apparently choosing Anderlecht over us. Um, mm. I saw Nathaniel tweet that one. It's so, strange though. Up. Like it must be something to do with the agents, maybe. Mm. Um, that and there are either players. Well, most of the players we've been linked to are either at Fenerbahce or have been linked with Fenerbahce in the past. And two players, uh, Brian Reynolds and Alaha Sayamendesh or whatever. I still can't say his name. They both want to Just go to Anderlecht instead. It's a strange coincidence. So it make, make, makes me think maybe it's just a load of nonsense and there's just I mean, a link there. But I mean, I to know. be fair, Anderlecht, I believe, are technically in European football. So I would probably choose them as well. Over yeah. Well, in, in, in that country, aren't they, sir? I think we're only really going to get bigger names if it goes through in the summer. When yeah. like you can kind of build towards something because, yeah, well, however, gonna... even if we were to buy like Messi and Ronaldo this January, we're probably still not even going to get in the playoffs with them. But you need like possibly, but because we're we're so far through the season, but if um, you know, we can build towards something with a better squad in the summer, maybe we can attract better players. Mm. I mean, a lot of them obviously might is 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 very very easy paper talk very easy story to share or sell um, because obviously of Action's comments about wanting to bring Turkish players or Turkish league players and staff across managers from various Turkish clubs are getting rumoured to be coming to I us um, it's the fourth manager yeah. link we've had now so you know it's, it's very very easy so any of them I think should be looked at with, with sort of maybe the, the tiniest pinch of salt um, I think some of the realistic ones will probably be the ones where it's the likes of Regan Slater. I think the, the interest in him is probably genuine. I think um, a couple of the players that are rumoured to be... I think, so, actually, I'll ask that now then. Josh McGuinness, apparently going to Wigan. Now, there's a, for some reason, he seems quite marmite with the fan base as Josh McGuinness. I mean, mm. you know, the guy scored 18 league goals last season and was pivotal... In, in in winning the title this season even me included I'm not going to pretend that I haven't 
has, he has been under a bit of criticism. And to me, I would welcome him going to the likes of Wigan. You know, he's, he's, he's early 30s. He's, he's probably wanting to keep it in the uh, national team. Maybe looking at his form and thinking I might be up for being dropped here. If he goes to Wigan and reignites his goal scoring form, possibly back in the championship next season, hmm. it probably would be a good move for him because I think at the minute we aren't giving him the service that he needs to to succeed. I think that last season's system actually benefits him more than this current one. Uh, and I think if we're going to carry on with this system, he unfortunately doesn't fit it. And obviously, you're going to look at the likes of like the, the Zeves as well that that is yet to be proven consistently uh, to play in this way. Uh, but for me, I would allow him to go, but I'm not in the camp that he's shit. I just think that he's having quite an inconsistent season. Um, I just think maybe the championship's a level too high for him at the moment, or he's just been a victim of the current system um, that we're playing. Uh, what are your two thoughts on it? I'll let you go, Nathaniel. All right. Well, I mean... I yeah, I mean it feels always harsh because like I'm not a professional footballer and he's achieved more than me or whatever. But I don't think maybe uh, the championship would have been his level had he played there like first before he was 29 or something. But I just don't think he's adapted to it, and he's had he's, he's never really played in a good team. To be fair, he's played in a terrible Bolton team and then terrible City teams really at, at times. So. Uh, that's not helped him either. But yeah, clearly League One is his level. Like he, he scores scores for fun there. I think any League One team should be happy to have him. Um because you know last year he was so good and he's got the experience as well. Um but yeah I think if we have to get rid of a striker maybe to bring one in just for the you know the fairness that someone's not gonna play at all if we do get one in which we need to You'd rather keep Eves, I think, because of the work rate. And he's sort of impressed me more this season than McGuinness. So I think it would be a good move for all teams and uh, all parties. And I don't think we'd give him a new contract in the summer with this form. So we might as well try and get a bit of money from him now. Um, but he's he's got a great character. And, you know, he's, he, won, he helped win us the league last year. So I still love him. I just don't know whether... He's going to help a huge amount for the next six months, mm. but I don't think you agree, Will. No, no sorry, I was, reacting to, I was reacting to the, my television. Oh, uh, as Man United scored. No, I agree. I, I did agree with you, Nathaniel. Actually, I agree with pretty much everything you said. Nice to know oh. he was paying attention. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> what about you, then, Will? What's your thoughts on yeah. McGinnis possibly leaving? I think he should. Yeah, I, I, I think he sake. deserves better than yeah, not scoring here. Rather than for us. Yeah. It's a shame because he scored on the first uh, day, but I almost said it in the last pod. Him missing that penalty against Peterborough has just taken all his confidence. And um, he's not scored since then. And uh, I think after two and a half years at this level, we can sort of tell that, you know, it's not the best for him. So, um, you know, I think he can leave, uh, you know, with a decent legacy. Uh, not a terrible record, really, overall. Um, and uh, I hope I hope he goes and gets promoted uh, again with Wigan. Yeah, I think I think every pretty uh, pretty much most City fans, definitely. I know there's a few that, that don't rate him at all and are quite happy to see the back of him. But I think that for the for the vast majority of the fan base, we would probably thank him and wish him well, kind of thing. Obviously, he's is is in is one of the few players that can say that they've won a league title with Hull City. So, uh, he's in he's in a very special club of players. Um, obviously, the fans went there to see it, unfortunately. Um, but I do think that moving to a top League One side would do his career very good, considering he could be back in the Championship next season. Yeah, uh, poor, and, poor and, Wigan supporters are going to be having the same conversation as we are now in a year's yeah, time yeah. to get promoted. <laughs> oh, he's only scored two goals, or should he go to? Should we sell him to Rotherham? <laughs> you know. I think yeah. because he had that season when no one was what was around to watch it. In a way, I don't think that helped him as a result. No. No. 
Although it might have helped him. To see him do that, he'd have a lot more goodwill. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Which is a yeah, bullshit yeah. reason, but that is the, probably a reason. No, yeah. it's a legitimate reason. Like, obviously, you, you, it's the same reason that kind of you could say that Grant McCann kept his job because there weren't fans in the stadium to to vent the frustration on a, on a game-to-game basis. And we probably won la- the league last year because there was no fans in the stadium with that negativity swelling the players, you know? Yeah. There's, 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 there is legitimate reasons with fans not being there and not um, sort of connecting with the team, um, not being able to connect with McCann after winning the league because, you know, we went there to watch it. We watched it on telly and then came back and saw us lose all the time again. It is, yeah. it is, it is legitimate reasoning, like... Um, but like we say, uh, if he does go, I wish him all the best because he will do very well in in, in in a Wigan side that's up there. Um, I think in terms of keeping all the players in, so like players that we don't want really want to lose, you're looking at the likes of uh, uh, Keen Lewis Potter, who's getting you know interest from West Ham and Brentford. Um, uh, there's a couple of whispers that are Premier League clubbers who are looking at George Honeyman. Um, you know. Can we afford to lose these players? Would you cash in on no. them if they offered, let's say, what more than what they're worth? Maybe I don't know what what I mean. We're going to quote silly figures for KLP. He's obviously only twenty years old, young and English. Um, but um, I think Honeyman, you could probably convince five to ten million. In in my opinion, I think he's invaluable. Very good set piece taker. Five to ten million, easy. But five it's million. Because to me, but to six me, months left. The player is worth. A player's transfer value is a mixture of all sorts. So you've got what value he is to your team, the contract length that he's got, his current form, his stats of that season, his age, maybe in some cases nationality, because English players are always an absolute fortune. There's a lot to take into account. And if you think George Honeyman and how pivotal he is to this team, how much this club, how much he's worth to us and the way that we play... Mm. And you're thinking he's only worth five to ten million. <laughs> well, okay. So if he didn't that, have that, six that, months left, terms, like how long is how much would he be worth? Like, if he had no, there's no four year contract. Game. Yeah, you're not getting astronomical figures for a player with six months left in his contract. No chance. Well, ten million is astronomical for Honeyman if with six months. It's not astronomical is it in modern day football. Is of course it? Is. Well, in today's market, no, for a championship player going in into today's the market, league. that isn't astronomical anymore. No. That's it is. It, I, it isn't. I, I think it really is. I mean, you've got to look no, at it, like the... it is in a real world sense, yeah. <laughs> but in terms of football, it isn't anymore. I don't. I don't know. I I don't know about that. And KLP is not worth less than a hundred million, so you can stop. That. <laughs> oh, that's true. Yeah. Um, I I think if 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 we had the arms and we knew that it wouldn't be reinvested, then definitely not. But with new owners who might want to sign top you know division italian turkish players potentially and you got you know 10 million for honeyman and you knew that was going to be reinvested wisely um it wouldn't be terrible but you don't want to see him go but i think um you know they're all world class but we can sign several world class players for 10 million to use it i mean properly. i think it all comes down to so if i asked you right now nathaniel would you say George Honeyman is a Premier League standard player. Well, he, he was against Everton, wasn't he? So, yeah, I guess so. And then, if you, if he was playing, let's say he was an Everton player and he put in that kind of performance on a regular basis. Yeah. And, then and he was said, Brazilian. He's going to cost you five to ten million. Yeah. Would you be saying the same thing? Well, five million, I'd bite your hand off. Ten million, I'd just go, ooh, we don't know about that. I mean, because he's still what is he mid twenties? So he's still he's got twenty seven, I think. Twenty seven. So peak of so he's still peak of got, midfield. Right? Yeah. yeah. So he's he's still in he's still at the you know the, the peak of his powers. He can easily go for another three or four years at, at this level, uh, consistently. And you got to mm. think, you know, like I said, how valuable he is to us. As a, and I think he could walk into most, um, especially in the lower half of that league table where they need a player that 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 puts that amount of effort in uh, and can contribute assists on a regular basis through set pieces and stuff. He it can be set pieces alone can be the difference between staying up and going down in the Premier that League. That being said, his set pieces this season have been terrible, to be fair. He got an assist against against Everton. Yeah, I mean it's just typical that you, you can't know. base someone's <laughs> entire thing on one game though. You can 
He's yeah. back to his best. That's what we do on these podcasts. We, you know, we got to <laughs> man who says be exaggerated. England, you can't do it. Next week, Honeyman might be League One standard. We don't know. Uh, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but so, we're, we're, I, 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 really, it's hard to talk about players coming in because you just don't know. I mean, to me, when it's an impossible in, discussion until the chance take off happens. It's very, very tough talk. I, I mean, think... to me, the owner should be coming in and looking at tying down players to, to contracts and signing some of the loanies permanently, if not all of them. To me, I'd love George Honeyman to be a Hull City player for the next five to ten years and be one of them players who captains us and stays for a very long time. Like, because he's just he's just an absolute workhorse and he's he's he is invaluable to us at the minute. You got to look at, um, you know, KLP maybe give him some better wages so that if not if even at worst case scenario we stay like you know a lower echelon table side and he gets his deserved Premier League move. At least we get a decent wad of cash for him and. Um, Jacob Greaves the same. Um, maybe bring Baxter, Bernard, and Longman in permanently. You know, you, they're more realistic things to talk about and to expect. Yeah. Um, I think that the what the new owners need to be looking at is what shape do they want the team to be in next year. Um, obviously, I don't think has, Hun- has, has Huddleston got an option of an extension. Yes. No idea. Yeah, because you see, to me. The fact that he's not playing that well, I don't think new owners would come in and be like, hmm. do you know what I mean? If he doesn't play that often, I can't see them wanting him to stay, being the age that he is kind of. Do you know what? It is? Mm-hmm. They're going to want to have a future plan and they're going to look at what they want that squad to be like next season. You're going to look at your more aging players that haven't got long left and think, right, can I sign somebody to replace you? Um, kind of thing and phase you out the squad. I think that's why we're probably looking at the likes of Regan Slater, because if you look at um, that sort of role, you've got Smallwood and Huddleston who are both sort of getting on in that respect. Um, so, like, you know, that's what I mean. The transfer at the minute is anyone anyone's guess. Um, I guess we'll move on to Stoke then with that. Mm. So, um, very tough game. Obviously, um, I thought we played well against the last form. time. They've not been in the best form. I think what the, the eighth at the minute, I think, but with a couple of games in hand on the top six, um, mm. I think they've won one of the last four. Is it? Let me just check. They, so they lost to Derby at home, drew to Middlesbrough, beat QPR, and then lost to Preston in the league. So it's inconsistent, that yeah, you know, the, the, the maybe starting to get a bit found out kind of thing um going off the Everton performance surely we can try and win that game if the takeover is done surely we're winning with you know new owners surely I I think we'll win I'm fairly I'll take a draw I mean yeah I would take a draw because they're a decent side but I I think we can win this Mm. yeah I think I think we've got every reason to go for it absolutely I think if you like if you could bottle up that performance from Everton and, and and play that every game, we'd 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 be mid table. Um, That's the thing, though. They've set that standard. They need to match it. Now. They really do, yeah. So um, then, in terms of, of playing, then what what side <laughs> do you play? Do you play the same eleven that started against Everton, or do we go back? You to our... You wouldn't change it, would you? Um, but start at the same time, would you? You say think... you, if you don't change it, Randall Williams is starting above Longman. No, no, I think you you don't change it, but you start Longman. Uh, oh, as in, you don't change. change no, but you don't change the whole thing. You know, yeah. it, basically, that's our strongest eleven at the moment. Keep anyway, the same, but put Longman and right wing back. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, that's back, arguably, I think our strongest side at the minute. Obviously, do, yeah. we, do we keep Smallwood in the side for it? Yeah, I think so. I'm not sure whether Huddleston has the legs really. Uh, Smallwood doesn't, though. Yeah, that's what I mean. That you it is funny. Kind of it is. Kind of it's also. It, it's half funny, or half hilarious, and half extremely worrying, especially against Damari Gray at the weekend. Seeing someone with pace like Gray run forward, and Smallwood's just ten yards behind, desperately trying to keep up, and he just can't. Um, yeah. So, but I think maybe Huddleston doesn't do that as much because he's got better positioning, or he just yeah. stays deeper all the time. Like he's basically like a fourth centre back if we're playing three at the back. So, so yeah, I go, I go Smallwood. So it's what we're saying then. So Eves and Smith up top, 
KLP yeah. and Longman as the wing backs. Our usual midfield three of Doherty, Honeyman, and Smallwood. And then the usual back uh, three and goalkeeper of Bernard, uh, McLaughlin, Greaves, and Baxter. Yeah. Which I think I would pretty, so. probably be the side. Um, I don't think that there's much room for change there. I do like the options off the bench at the minute. Like we say, Moncair, uh, Randall Williams, they, they do look good. Yeah. Um, we've got variation that you could probably play um, a couple of others at wing back and push either the KLP or Longman up top as well. Uh, we've got Alfie Jones to come back if needs be. Um, it, it, we do look like we're getting sort of our squad back, uh, which is going to be important, obviously, in, especially in a transfer window where players are going to be playing for the future. Um, so... We take a point, I think, was the gist of that one. I think we can definitely go for the win. We can be confident enough to say we're for the win. Mm -hmm. um, if we lose, then, obviously, taking Panic. performances out of the equation, um, that means we haven't won for, what was it, since the oh, early December, was it? Don't don't, don't say that. That's Three league games in a row. But this, but this is like what, what Brownie was saying on his episode. The problem with social media and us as fans and our expectation you know, mm. we had we had that run where we were unbeaten in six, but the first four were wins, but then we've not won since. Yeah. So, you know, does does that negativity start to creep in, especially with the takeover being announced and people seeing that as maybe an excuse to let McCann go? Can he really afford to lose against Stoke? Just for I the mean, fans' opinion. If, if you told me, like, you know, in any of the periods where McCann and the team have been doing terribly, that... You know, when a new takeover comes in, that it's almost definitely going to want like a a, a Turkish manager, perhaps, because um, that seems to be their thing. And I'm like past me is talking to present me, uh, saying, "Why on earth do you not want McCann out immediately? Because of how bad it's been, and like have I forgotten about it?" But it's really difficult to say. I mean, I think maybe if he does lose, uh, be a bit panicky, but. I don't think we will. We don't have to worry about it. But like you say, like we've got we've got a good run of games at home now. Where we yes, yeah, four, four out of five. Where we've been playing well at home. I mean, I know we lost to Everton, but we have, we've been playing very, very well at home. And I think yeah. that game against Everton should give them the confidence to really want to take the game to Stoke. And with them being in the form they are, and another thing that Brownie mentioned, you know, they will know the mentality of the dressing room. They'll think. They, they've come off boil lately. We can take advantage of that. If we get, a, get at them early, you know, worry them a bit, we could probably unsettle them and take control of the game. So yeah. it's going to be one of them where I think you've got to start well against Stoke. I think the longer the game goes on, they'll they'll start to pile the pressure on. But hopefully we can get one or two up and just sort of um, hold it off. Um, I did share a, a retweet something earlier. I think one of uh, an account on Twitter did share it. Um, we are, I think we've only conceded two goals past the 75th minute. Yeah, that's very surprising because that's usually something we're terrible with. Yeah. Like the Adkins Slutsky era, it was every game. Yeah. Which means we're seeing games out well. Or know, we're already losing. So it already losing they've took the foot off the gas. Um, <laughs> they've stopped probing mm. as much, but um, it's a positive stat for us, which which um, we haven't had many. So, wait, so who is the second team? Because obviously one of them Bristol. Was it Peterborough? Mm, I'm doing I can't this. remember. They, they didn't Let mention me the two teams. I'd have to go have a look. Well, one was definitely Bristol. We know that. That was 92nd minute. Uh, well, I mean, does the Everson game count? 99th <laughs> minute. I don't think that counts. It's not in the league. Um, Nottingham Forest, no. Reading. Well, Nottingham Forest was 72nd minute, so not far off. Uh, West Brom, no. Brief intermission while we do some research. This, Huddersfield and Peterborough were both like 73rd minute ish. Um, Stoke, no. Sheffield United, no. This is riveting stuff for anyone listening to Fulham, us. no. <laughs> QPR. The audio listeners. QPR was 74th minute. Oof. Uh, that's no, that's accor that's... according to that stat, they're wrong. It's only the one team. But we've had several 72, 73, 74. Mm. I'll have to go re revisit the tweet and then... We'll, well, you can go correct them if you want, Nathaniel. You, you go show no. them the evidence. Show yeah, them a screen um... record. <laughs> um... 
<laughs> but yeah, I, I mean, I think there's not much more that we can say about the Stoke game. We, you know, we, we, we've been out of league action since Blackpool. Um, the squad played well against Everton, so hopefully we can carry that in. Probably play an expected 11 that we mentioned. Um, I think all that's left then, uh, you will have seen um, earlier on to, well, I say today, the time of this recording, um, we... We announced that obviously Andy's Man Club are the charity partner of the podcast. So any sort of fundraisers we do will go to that charity to help with men's mental health, talking groups, and um, supporting people that way. Uh, we have actually just released a shirt, which is going to be like we'll wear them on stream sometimes, probably not all the time. I mean, I will. I don't know about you guys, um, but it's a very nice shirt, very tiger print design. We've managed to get both our uh, podcast sponsors of Full City Retro and Six Yards out on the sleeves. We've got the Fanob logo on the back. Um, and then the main sort of uh, prominent sponsor on the front is the hashtag Andy's Man Club. Um, the, the shirts will be priced at £35 per shirt, but £7.50 of each shirt that you buy will go straight to the Andy's Man Club charity. Um, so in doing, obviously in buying that shirt, you are supporting um, people, supporting mental health in that as aspect. Um, there is... The Andy's Man Club Hull branch, obviously, that's got four walk-in centres available in the city. So you're going to help keep them running and give people the support that they need. So um, they are available for pre-order. Uh, what date are we on today? It's the 10th, in it? So they will be available for pre-order or midday on the 11th, Tuesday the 11th. So you can pre-order them. So they the might end. already be available by the time you see this. Probably will be, yeah, because I don't think we want to release both the Phil Brown episode and this one in very quick succession. It's probably a lot of us to listen to. You, we, we'd rather you not do that. We'll not put you through that. <laughs> but obviously, like I said, uh, so this was another episode that's sponsored by Hull City Retro and Six Yards Out. Uh, the links will be on the link tree uh, with every episode release as usual, so do go check them out. Uh, do support Hull Badge Men if you can. Uh, they're struggling, especially with the epidemic at the minute. Uh, and do go have a look at what Andy's Man Club does, uh, their aims and everything that you could potentially be um, contributing to. So before we finish then, uh, there was a couple of features that we keep forgetting to do that I've just been reminded of that we will do. So um, match predi score predictions first uh, for Stoke then. So I'll come to you first, Will. One all. One all. Fair. Fair. Nathaniel? Brian Longman. <laughs> um, I'll go. I'll go two nil. I'll go two nil when I'm. I'm so mildly confident. I'm going to go for a nil nil. I can't remember the last time we had a nil nil. Oh, how dull! Uh, I think we're due one, aren't we? Uh, I'm going for a nice, one, yeah. nice, solid nil nil. Promising performance okay. going into the next game. Entertaining game on Sky. That yes, lovely, lovely entertaining game. I mean, we always play poor on Sky, so I'd take a nil nil. Um, <laughs> so we was we we. we I think who was it who feed? I think Joel featured on um, another podcast, and they did this as a as a feature, and it's and it sounded quite funny. Uh, but we're going to take quite a twist on it. So rather than saying, "Are we doing our own meal deals, or should we do the players?" What do we reckon? Choose a player and choose their meal deal, or do you want to do your own? Oh, I don't know what they're deep. They do our own. What? What's going on here? Oh, we'll do our own then. Because I mentioned that I could potentially pick a player from the squad, and you guys choose what you think they would go into. This. Like Josh McGinnis, for example, who's definitely getting. Um, an all-day breakfast sandwich, uh, a Monster <laughs> Energy, and uh, a chocolate fudge brownie or something. Yeah, the young yeah, I was so. thought into that. But no, it, so we'll do ours because I feel like uh, Joel was very embarrassed by his. Uh, Will, what was Joel's? Because you seem to know it because I think he bought it with you, didn't he, on the way to Blackpool? What was Joel's meal deal? He's not on this, but we're going to sell him out. <laughs> you know what? I'm trying to remember it now, but it was very boring. Um, yeah. Was it was it was it a ham sandwich, bottle of water, and a packet of fucking ready salty crisps? No, he didn't even have crisps. He had a chocolate bar. <laughs> oh, um, that's worse. That's yeah. Just uh, it was a wrap. Cat. I can't remember what was in the wrap. I, oh, I get boost. We'll get Joel to tweet. Yeah, choice of chocolate bar in a boost, and I can't yeah. remember what drinks got. We'll get Joel to tweet is. Uh, what is your meal deal then, Will? You walk straight into Tesco, three pound meal deal. What are you choosing? I love that this is our ending. This. Um, <laughs> hmm. I'm going to ask the listeners for that as well. Yeah. <laughs> All day breakfast, as already mentioned, probably. Mm -hmm. Just like Packet of either. Well, I will say either. It depends on what's in that Tesco's. McCoy salt and vinegar. Say the oh. whole stocking. I don't know what. Okay then, McCoy salt and vinegar. Okay. Uh. 
and a lovely Dr. Pepper. Uh, yuck. Nothing Dr. you can call that. How fucking Dr. Dare you? Pepper? Dr. Pepper's disgusting. It's not. Disgusting. Sorry, you it's have disgusting. No taste. It's disgusting. No, just sorry. Go on, then. Just, just put your money where your mouth is. Okay. Um, for for the main meal, I'd go tomato and uh, cheese pasta sort of thing. You get those in, oh, in Tesco. He's not even What's going on? Oh, okay. oh I know, because they're nice. You know, okay. like all the sandwiches are a bit bland. You know, so go for cheese and tomato pasta. Um, McCoy's cheese and onion, because McCoy's yeah. is great, but uh, cheese and onion is is the superior. I think you'll find it's the superior flavour. Um, okay, well, maybe from your point of view. But, uh, and then I go for my um, favourite, like, Coca-Cola variant, which is um, Diet Coke or Coca-Cola Zero Sugar, as it's you pretentiously really called. How dare you say Dr Pepper shit and then say Diet Coke? Well, Dr Pepper's not really a Coca-Cola variant because it's not... It's, like, it's, it's so horrid, it doesn't on. deserve to be... <laughs> You know, mentioned is the same thing. So um, that's my three. Top mm. quality listening. Disgusting behaviour. I can't <laughs> believe this is the most heated it's got on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll do it. We'll do a separate buy podcast where um, midweek we'll release a, a meal deal uh, review episode. Um, <laughs> right. So mine, mine varies. You see, for for like what time of day it is. But well, mine varies. But and that's I'm, I'm going to get, scold, get scolded from my sandwich choice, right? But I'm standing by it and I'm being valiant. I would get a prawn sandwich. I'm a West. I would. I'd be considered yeah. a Westlander. Right. No, you've no, lost. No, 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 no. You need listening. to be kicked off the it. podcast. I'm not listening to it. Disgraceful. Are amazing, and you're just you're you're disliking it. Should be ashamed. You you're all sheep. Um, my snack would be. Sorry, like what you're saying? We're all sheep. Yes. When I had, ant- I- I'm not a sheep. I have fucking anchovies and shit on pizza. I'm not a sheep. <laughs> no, yeah, you're, you're you're a wrong one. That that's what you're. <laughs> so you clearly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> my snack would be. Um, I, I'm not a big fan of crisps. I never really have been. Oh, so yeah, probably... you're getting worse. It's getting worse. Right. This. What do you mean? Crisps are noisier and annoying. You're not a big fan of things. crisps. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hey, it's a mash shit. You don't want to be doing that about. Me. So. Um, I would go for a, I would probably, I mean, I said McGinnis would get this and I think I'd get it too. I'd, I'd get a chocolate fudge brownie one. Like I, 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 I'm talking, I mean, they're, they're always small, so it disappoints me, but I still get mm. them like that big, but they're always nice. I look, I love brownie. Well, actually, uh, then, chocolate wise, well, if they have a, 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 um, a white chocolate Twix extra, I would go for that because they're lovely. Even, I don't even think I know what that is. Well, you know what a Twix is? Is it yeah, Twix? It. That's white, white chocolate. White chocolates, and it's longer. Uh, <laughs> can't even remember the name, man. Yeah. Weird, but okay. Yeah. Um, the drink, I'm going to be um, your typical hoodie-wearing Kyle, and I'm going to get a Mango Monster Energy. Mm, I will never understand why anyone gets energy drinks. Very, very. Because, because they're horribly addictive, okay, Will? <laughs> I have a problem. Mm. <laughs> like, look, you clearly do have a I problem. always have yeah. one. Yeah. Prawn sandwich. <laughs> yeah, energy drink, prawn sandwich, and a chocolate fudge brownie. That that is that's, a very varied meal. That's eclectic. <laughs> right. So, um, anybody listening? I feel sorry feel for. Uh, I feel I feel bad mouth for uh, bad mouthing you now, Nathaniel. After hearing that. Yeah. yeah thank sure. you. Thank you. That means a lot. <laughs> Um, we'll we'll try and get Joel to send his in because I'm really interested to see Joel. I, I do think the entire world will be disappointed. Um, but anybody listening, if you want to send your choice of meal deal in, or if you want to comment on how disgusting ours is, feel free. That's fine. I'll defend. Mean how disgusting yours is. Mm. <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm willing to have that fight. Call me out on it. Um, but other than that, like I say, yeah, do check out the new uh, podcast share if you've not seen it. Um, it has been tweeted out. Uh, I'll tweet it again tomorrow. When it's ready for pre-order, so you don't miss it. Um, if you want in reminding, that is. Uh, and check out the Phil Brown episode, obviously, um, that we've we have we have released prior to this. Um, it was a very good discussion, very good listen. I'm yet to listen to it back, but I'm going to uh tonight, I think, uh see what I was like on a live episode, because I think that I'm gonna be quite embarrassed. I hate watching myself back. Um but yeah, so again, thanks to our sponsors, thanks to you two for joining me. Um, hopefully we're talking about a, a positive performance at least against Stoke next time out and potentially I know we said this last time it's the last it's episode happening. Of it's the happening this era. week See, if I keep saying it every episode it's eventually right that's 
Mm, okay. Well, I might as well say now as well, in case anyone's still listening after that past debacle we've just gone through, mm. it's Adjun Illagella. Just Adjun, in case anyone wants to know. Adjun Illagella. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm still calling you Adjun. I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> and on that <laughs> bombshell. Anyone, <laughs> after that meal deal thing. <laughs> Uh, a Turkish lesson as well at the end of this episode. You've been treated. Uh, so, if anyone's actually still with us at this point, thanks for being <laughs> <and> enduring. <laughs> and we will, we will catch you next time, hopefully, um, with a very positive episode. Um, if reports are to be believed, and hopefully, um, at least a couple of uh, substantiated transfer rumours have, have started to come to fruition. Uh, but so, thank you for joining me, you two, and we will see you next time. Shake it up, baby. 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 Shake it up, baby.